Hi, so in this video, we're going to talk about the domain eukarya and animal development, how that's used in organizing and determining phylogeny of organisms. So here's some timestamps. We'll see how well this works in post. If not, this will work as an outline for what this video aims to cover. So we're going to briefly talk about the three domains in locomotion. Then we'll talk about the eukarya supergroups. And then lastly, we'll talk about animal, animal development, and how it's used to determine uh, relationships. So first, let's look at the three domains once more. So we've got bacteria, archaea, and then eukarya or eukaryota. So something just to understand about eukarya is if you hear the term protists, this is an informal term, which just means anything in eukarya that is not a animal, plant, or fungi. All right, so let's start with talking about a little bit of locomotion. So in the description below, I will provide some links to uh, depictions of flagella, cilia, and pseudopodal motion, because I think it's important to have a visual of. Um, so check out those links for those. And then lastly, crawling and swimming. I feel like you can probably imagine, you know, babies crawl, swimming, think of fish. And then lastly, there's sessile or immobile. So this is an organism doesn't have an built or a built-in locomotion style, and it might rely on the environment to actually move it. So now let's look at the four supergroups of uh, eukarya. So we've got Unaconta, Archiplastida, Excavata, and SAR. So let's start with Unaconta. So there's four subgroups that you need to be aware of. You've got your amoebozoans, coanoflagellates, fungi, and animals. Amoebozoans, these are just slime molds. They can be free living or parasitic, and they utilize pseudopodial motion. Coanoflagellates are super important because they are the ancestor between protists and animals. So you can see this in this image here, how similar a coanoflagellate looks to a sponge collar cell right here. So we'll talk about more of that in the next slide. So then lastly, you've got fungi and animals, which we'll talk more about later in this course and animals later in this video. So here's the coanoflagellates one more time. So again, so there's some evidence for why we believe these are some sort of ancestor or the most closely related group to existing animals today. One of which is just how similar, the traits are almost identical to periphera collar cells and periphera is sponges. So here's a sponge. If we look in, we've got the specialized type of cell called the collar cell, and it looks very similar. Collar cells are also found only in other animals. So we don't see this in anywhere else in the other domains, just animal. So some of those animals being uh, jellyfish, flatworms, and starfish. So that would be um, cnidarians, platyhelminthes, and echinoderms. Third evidence is there's DNA analysis between coanoflagellates and collar cells, and this supports the above claim. As well as fourth, another additional evidence is these coanoflagellates demonstrate a colonial behavior, as you can see right here. That colonial behavior tells us that most likely the ancestor over here probably had a similar behavior, and that could have ended up going into a multicellular organism. So now let's look at the supergroup Archaeoplastida. So this includes red algae, green algae, and land plants, and that's not a land plant. These are some land plants, these are my own, and they won't stop dying. So just be familiar with the names here. So now we'll look at excavata, which includes three subgroups, is the diplomonads, parabacillids, and the euglenozoans. So these first two both have modified mitochondria, multiple flagella, and are all almost all parasitic. The euglenozoans are a pretty diverse group. They can be predatory heterotrophs or photosynthetic autotrophs or parasites. They have flagella, photoreceptors, which are eye spots, and kinetoplastids, which is a special kind of euglenozoan, have organized masses of DNA. The last group we'll be looking at is the SAR group, SAR standing for the stromenophiles, alveolates, and the rhizarians. The, stromeno sorry, the stromenophiles typically have two types of flagella, hairy and smooth, and then they've got four subgroups, which we'll talk about in a minute. The alveolates also have three subgroups, and we'll talk about those in just a moment as well. Rhizarians will only look at one subtype, which is the radiolarians, and they employ these tests, which are kind of like shells made of silica, for protection. They also use filamentous pseudopods to move and engulf prey for digestion. So here's an example of like what those tests look like.
So now we're looking at the shamanophiles, which have the four subgroups, which are diatomes, golden algae, brown algae, and umacytes. So important to know diatomes are the ones that remove CO2 from atmosphere. Golden algae are, a member, are per, important members of plankton. Brown algae is just multicellular seaweed, and then umacytes are water molds, which don't worry about those. So here's a shamanophile in general that had demonstrates how they have two types of flagellum. You've got the hairy and the smooth or hairless. Next, let's look at alveolates, which can have three subgroups, which are the dinoflagellates, AP complexins, and ciliates. These are what cause the red tide or blooms, which is explosive population growth, and that leads to discoloration of the water. The AP complexins, which are really fun, stands for complicated tip. They're all parasitic, and these complicated tips right here is actually what they use to invade hosts. Ciliates just use cilia, cilia to move and push nutrients into their mouth group, which you can kind of see one right here. So now that we've learned about all of the different uh, supergroups, let's talk about animals and animal development. So here are some traits that all animals share. So they're all multicellular, heterotropic, they all have specialized cells and some do have tissues. So here's a heterotropic animal has to eat in order to sustain itself. All right, so let's talk about some degrees of specialization. So first we've got parazoa, which are just a group of organisms, typically including like sponges, which have very few cell types and are loosely organized into functional units. Then we can become more specialized with more different cell types, and these are now going to be organized, in, organized into more functional units called tissues that are separated by membranes. So it just gets more complex. Eumetazoans, which just means true multicellular animals, are the ones that will have these tissues. Another way we classify animals is based on symmetry. So here are three major types of symmetry. We've got asymmetrical, radial, and bilateral. Asymmetrical just means there's no central axis that you can draw a line and have a mirror image. So periphera and placozoa, so sponges in general, are asymmetrical. Then we'll look at radial symmetry, which means there's some sort of central axis that any way you splice it along that axis, you will get a mirror image of the organism. So the way I think about it is a bicycle wheel. If you were to lay that flat on the ground, no matter how you were to cut that, you would get some sort of mirror image. Lastly, we've got bilateral, which just means that there's one central axis that you can cut one specific direction in order to get a mirror image. So we'd have to cut this human straight down the center, head to feet or vice versa in order to get a mirror image. One final exception to the symmetry is we've got a pentaradial symmetry, the, um, which we see in echinoderms, which is just starfish and sea urchins and sand dollars. This is just another type of symmetry and you'll learn more about it later in the course. So now let's talk about the development of germ layers. So all animals have a Hox gene, which regulates body development, which is why they all follow the similar plan. It begins with some sort of egg and sperm fertilizing each other to form a zygote, which we see here, and then it'll undergo division and start cleaving into multiple cells, eventually into hundreds, to form this blast uh, blastula, which we see here. It's just a hollow sphere. The internal, the hollow part, is going to be filled with a fluid, and that's called your blastocele. Now remember, seal just means cavity, so that should help you identify some words in the future. All right, so after we've formed this blastula, it's going to then have invagination called gastrulation, where our, it's going, the cells will start folding in on itself to form this ar um, archenteron. When that happens, now we can start seeing different types of cell layers. We'll have our ectoderm, which is the external layer to the environment, and then the internal layer here is the endoderm. So, once this opening occurs, we call this interior part the archenteron, and this opening right here is the blastopore. Now, this blastopore is super important because it can either become the mouth or the anus of the organism, and based on which one this blastopore becomes tells us if it's a protostome or deuterostome. Stome means mouth, proto is first, deutero is second. So, protostome would be first mouth, deuterostome is second mouth, so therefore anus will be forming from the blastopore. So after we have the endoderm, 
the endoderm and I'm sorry, the endoderm and the ectoderm forming, then we're going to start forming our mesoderm in between those two layers. And this only occurs in triple blastic organisms because they have three layers. So this again forms between the ectoderm and endoderm and it can form in two different ways. So it can either form uh, schistocele or interiocele. And that's we'll talk about a little bit more in the next slide. Based on whether or not you are a protostome or deutostome, it forms your uh, mesoderm will form differently. Um, we can see that we're comparing protostomes and deuterostomes. So initially, there is a difference between their cleavages. So in protostomes, they have spiral and determinate cleavage, which means that early on, they these cells will have a determined function. So they know what they're going to become, and as a result, they grow at different rates. Versus when we're looking at the uh, deuterostomes, they have indeterminate cleavage, and as a result, these cells are not specialized. They act as stem cells and become, can become anything early on. And that's why they have such equal growth. Now, when we look at the coelom formation, so this is also the formation of that mesoderm, we can see in protostomes, it forms from our ectoderm, this blue layer here, at the base of our um, archenteron, versus in the deuterostomes, there's a folding and outgrowth of our endoderm into a new mesoderm layer that we'll see in another uh, image. It will pinch off and then start to form the coelom. So let's look at the next image. So here's a better illustration of that. So up on top, we're looking at our deuterostomes, which are forming from the endoderm. We see these little outgrowths of mesoderm that eventually break off, become this little loop, and the coelom is this internal part, and it'll eventually stretch the cover. Whoops. It'll eventually stretch and cover the entire internal cavity of the blastocele. Now, if we're looking at protostomes, we can see that the mesoderm starts to arise from the ectoderm here and eventually also grow until the coelom forms and completely encompasses that blastocele. All right, so now the arrangement and presence of these body cavities does differ between organisms. So bilateranes can be either acelomates, which means they don't have a body cavity, pseudocelomates, which means the mesoderm only partly lines the blastocele. And then we have coelomates, also known as eucelomates, which means a true coelom is made with a complete lining of blastocele with mesoderms. So this next image illustrates this very well. Here's a flatworm, which is an acelomate. As you can see, there's no white space here because the mesoderm completely fills the interior of the organism and there is no uh, cavity. Now, if we look at the coelomates, we can see that there's um, mesoderm completely lining the ectoderm and the endoderm, and we have this white space that is our coelom. Lastly, we've got the pseudocelomates, which are nematodes or um, roundworms. This is where the mesoderm only lines one of the layers, in this case, the ectoderm, and this is a pseudocelom because it is not completely lined in mesoderm. So that concludes this video. I'm sorry there was a lot of information, but I really hope that it was helpful.